Our scripture reading this morning is Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 15. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. You guys doing well? Outstanding. Do you guys believe that the gospel changes everything? I do. I'm convinced of that. We've been working our way through the book of Romans. It's been a phenomenal study. We did a little mini-series from Easter to last weekend, four-week series on epic transformation. Now we head into some troubled waters. Yes, I like controversy. Actually, I don't, but, uh, but this, this chapter is all about controversy. There's a lot of controversy over this chapter 9 of Romans. If you have your Bibles, you're going to need them. Turn to chapter 9 of Romans. Many of you probably know what I'm talking about there. We're looking at verses 1 through 14 or 15, right around there. We're going to spend a couple weeks on this. And so the book of Romans, how the gospel changes everything. We're talking this weekend about the chosen. The chosen. This is part part one. I'm going to be a little less inspirational uh, this weekend. Not that I'm maybe ever inspirational, but uh, maybe I am. How many think I'm inspirational once in a while? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Help me. Help. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I needed that. I need that support. And so from time to time, I, I am inspirational, but I'm not going to be inspirational this morning. Just telling you, okay? And I'm going to be more in, instructional and more informational, though I might break out into some inspiration from time to time, okay? But the information should inspire you to want to stand up for the truth. Because this is a very controversial topic. I, I, feel like, I, I feel like we need to deal with it head on. And so it may be a little bit troubling for some of you. If you disagree with me, uh, don't run out of here before I'm finished, okay? Because I, I, you can come back and we'll, we would talk about it. I, I'll set up an appointment and we can work through it. Because uh, you may have some disagreements over this topic about the chosen and so uh, I'd love to sit down and chat with you about it. So go ahead and lock the doors right now, security. Okay, okay the doors are locked. You guys are stuck. Woo! Yeah, let me make sure everybody's here and accounted for. Let me see, make sure everybody's here. Okay, let me see. Okay, yeah, yep, 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 yep. Okay, I got you. Yep, you're all here. You're all here. Okay, that's good. That's all good. So here's a couple of questions I think that this chapter is going to help us understand is who are God's chosen people? If I were to ask you that, who are God's chosen people? Don't answer out loud, but how would you respond? Are you part of that chosen group? And yeah, okay, that's good. What makes you think so? So can anyone be a part of God's chosen people? Those are the first two questions on the growing notes. And I believe that this text helps us to answer that. 
Now, why are we heading in this direction? I mean, let me bring you up to speed. The first eight chapters of Romans are about how the gospel transforms our lives. And so it starts with doctrine, first eight chapters, doctrine about our beliefs, about the wealth of the gospel. The last five chapters, chapters 12 through 16, are about the difference the gospel makes in our lives. So it goes from doctrine to duty, from beliefs to behavior, the wealth of the gospel to how we walk that out. And that's typical to how Paul writes. When you read Colossians or Ephesians, this is typically what he does. He starts with a good foundation of beliefs, and then this is how your beliefs affect your behavior. But for some reason, he's not doing that here. In fact, why do the complex chapters of 9 through 11 seem like a very long diversion in which we're going to spend about six weeks just on these three chapters? Because I think they're that important for us to understand because they're, they are God's Word. And the reason why he, he, it seems as though he's taking this diversion is because Paul has made a strong case for, the, for God's faithfulness to believers, Romans 8. Romans 8, no condemnation, no separation for those of us that have put our faith in Christ. Woo, it's pretty amazing. No condemnation, no separation from his love. So he's made a pretty strong case for God's faithfulness to believers. So he's anticipating the question of why many of God's chosen people, the Israelites, have rejected the Messiah. So he was an, he's an Israelite. He's a Jew. He, he's following the Messiah, but he's wondering why, and, and people are going to be pushing back. Well, why aren't more Jews, they're God's chosen people, why aren't more jo- Jews following the Messiah? Now, here's where chapters 9, 10, 11 go. So Israel's past is found in Romans chapter 9, Israel's present is found in Romans chapter 10, and Israel's future is found in Romans chapter 11. That's where we're headed over the next six weeks or so as we work through this. And so I need a lot of help to walk through this. I need the work of the Holy Spirit, but you guys need a lot of help too to really be able to understand that. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's take a moment. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us through God's Word. Lord, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for your presence, and your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Your Word is a lamp to our feet, a light into our path. Open our eyes to wonderful things from your Word. Teach us your way, O Lord, that we may live according to your truth. Give us undivided hearts that we may experience a life filled with joy as we live for your glory, we pray in Jesus' beautiful name. And everyone said, amen. amen. So, so let's, let's go right into some controversy here. You're certainly going to want a set of notes. And if you didn't have a set of notes, uh, you might want to grab some real quick. You can walk back there or might want to have some handy, okay, because you want to follow along. There's a lot here, but who are God's chosen people? We're going to, first of all, give you the Calvinist perspective. How many by show of hands are familiar with this idea of Calvinism? Calvinism. And so Calvinism, it's also defined as what is known as the TULIP. It's an acronym that each of those letters represent a belief system. For instance, T represents total depravity. Uh, The U stands for unconditional election, L is, uh, is limited atonement, R is irresistible grace, and P is perseverance of the saints. And it, it, when you understand that, you've got to understand what they mean by each of those. I've heard a lot of different definitions, but to, to true, understand true Calvinism, you have to understand what they believe about them. A lot of Calvinists don't like to be called Calvinists, some at least. They would prefer to be called Reformed They're ref- in Reformed theology. And even uh, there are those that would try to soften it. We had a group in our church a number of years ago that they would try to soften it by calling them the doctrines of grace, which I have doctrines of grace too. They just happen to not be their doctrines of grace. But here's how they would define their soteriology, their doctrine of salvation, with a little bit of dose of determinism. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those definitions as we work through this. But this is what they teach. Calvinists teach that Christ self-sacrificially loves a pre-selected number of individuals, and before the world began, predestined them to salvation and the rest to eternal damnation based on nothing to do with their choices or actions. Sound troubling? To say the least. 
That's what they believe. Let's get it right from the source. So Calvinism from John Calvin got a lot of his from Augustine, but let's take a look at this uh, quote from John Calvin from his Institutes. Big book, big thick book. A lot of them embrace love. This is what he says. Therefore, those whom God passes over, that would be the non-elect. Actually, they called them the reprobates. He condemns, and this he does for no other reason than that he wills to exclude them from the inheritance which he predestines for his own children. That, my friends, is Calvinism, and there's, there's a lot of uh, very popular Calvinists in our culture today. Let me just name a few of those for you. John MacArthur. R.C. Sproul, John Piper, Timothy Keller, along with D.A. Carson, who's part of what is known as the Gospel Coalition, Vody Bauckham, Matt Chandler, um, Sinclair Ferguson, David Platt, just to name a few. By the way, I have books of almost every one of those, except for Vody Bauckham, in my library and have benefited from their writings, though I have never, I have never embraced their soteriology or their determinism, their divine determinism. And, uh, and when you look at Calvinism, this is not the most popular, I don't mean that you chase after what is most popular, but I'm just saying it's not the most popular within Christendom as far as this belief system. The more popular one is what I'm going to share with you in traditionalism or historical Christianity. But it's not the most popular, but certainly the loudest and the most influential in our culture currently. I love Calvinists, but I loathe their soteriology and their divine determinism. It, it, it is terribly troubling. I believe, uh, I believe that Calvinism is harmful emotionally and spiritually. See, when I talk about their, their divine determinism, their, uh, it's, it's really as they define sovereignty. And they define sovereignty as God divinely decrees everything that happens for His glory. That is the good, the bad, and the ugly. I mean, basically, it is a fixed game is how I would describe it. And that's why that's one aspect of it. It's just it's very t troubling. So I believe that Calvinism is harmful emotionally and spiritually. I'm still helping people to work through the trauma that they've received from their Calvinism. I think it's damaging. It's a low view of God. It, it misrepresents the nature and the character of God. As, as a gal that talked to Nancy this last week told her that it turns God into a monster, and I would agree with her. You see, our theology determines our methodology. Would you guys agree with that? Our theology determines our methodology. Makes sense. We're going to live that out in our life. So when you think out the implications of Calvinism to, to the furthest implication, this is what I found. Here's a couple of the extremes. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just telling you from my personal experience of having been around Calvinists before is that they, come to, they have these extremes, and it goes all the way from this. Uh, I, I see them in this. They're, they're the most elitist, proud, egotistical, pharisaical group I've ever come across in the church personally. I've, I've never had more mean things said about me and to me and about this church by any group of people. They're so, supposed to be our brothers in Christ. And there's just almost this elitist uh, mindset, and they, they will talk down to you oftentimes. They would talk down to me like, you don't know the Bible like we know it, and they're the smartest people in the room. And so that's that one extreme that I've seen come from that. And then the other extreme would be a, a kind of an, a fatalism. In fact, Man, there's, a, there's a lot of testimonies out there of these young, restless reform guys that are deconverting from Calvinism because they're traumatized. In fact, I saw, heard the testimony of two guys just this last week talking, no longer Calvinists, not even believers in God, but they recognize that as, as fathers, they loved their children, and yet when they would read this text that we're reading here in Romans 9, they were traumatized because it almost seems as though God the Father hates his children. 
And they were, they were talking about the trauma that they, they've just felt. If, that, if that's the way it is, I'm out. Well, that's not the way it is. There's a different view of that. In fact, I think it's more biblical. And so there's, there's people that have been, I mean, like I said, I've, I continue even to this day. There are people that have come through our DB life that, that have shared stories with me of the trauma and the baggage that they care from that, from that theology. Uh, what's interesting about this idea of the, what I find with, with the pride of Calvinists is that they, made, they seem to be more dead set on winning people to Calvinism than to Christ. When I would interact with them, they're trying to win me to their Calvinism, and I didn't see them very ambitious about trying to actually win people to Christ. And so here's what I'm wanting to, that we're, as we work through this. We're going to spend a couple weeks on this. Uh, we're going to take a break Mother's Day because this wouldn't be a very good Mother's Day present. As I'm, <laughs> I don't want mom to be mad at me, okay, because I talked about Calvinism and determinism and all of that on Mother's Day. So we're going to take a break next week, and then we'll come back and finish the chapter, okay? You guys good with that? So we'll have a big party, celebrate mom, and then we'll come back the following week and get down and go into more detail on a lot of this stuff. But this is what, I want you to learn to eat the meat and spit out the bones. I had somebody this the first service, this is what's fun about this, this last service, because I have a lot of people I interact with <laughs> between all the services. I had somebody in the last service actually come up to me with their, with their John MacArthur Bible, and they were traumatized. We said, well, I, got his, I have his commentary. But, I, but she said, look at this. This is a contradiction. I go, exactly. They, they double talk. There's a lot of contradictions because they can't. And you're going to see that as we kind of walk through this text. They can't, they can't be completely consistent in what they believe. So there's a lot of double. She actually showed me in the text in the commentary. She says, why? Can I even trust any of this? I go, I don't know. That's up to you. But you... Uh, you have, to, you have to use your brain. You have to use your noggin. You have to understand what they believe and how it's going to infiltrate a lot of their theology and their methodology as they explain this stuff. And so it's just, it's just I find that interesting. So I, I'm, I want you to learn to eat the meat, spit out the bones. I want you to be more like the Bereans. The Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they studied the Scriptures daily. In other words, they, they received what Paul was writing with eagerness, but they examined what he was saying with uh, with eagerness to see if it was truly the Word of God. Now think about this. This is the Apostle Paul who wrote a lot of the New Testament, and they're putting him to task, and they're going to study him out and say, hey, is that, is that biblical, Paul? I want you to do the same thing. Listen, when you come in here, don't check your brains at the door. I want you to learn how to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want you to be a smart-thinking Christian that understands truth from error. And that's why we cover topics like this, and, and it's so critical that we do. And let me, let me just say something. It was about two and a half years, almost three years ago, we had a major bout with COVID and Calvinism that infiltrated our church. And I'm telling you, by God's grace, we survived it, and we are a better church because of it. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. God has done some wonderful things as, as we had to navigate through that. I know that my wife and I took a major beating, and many of you took a beating too, but you hung in there, and you, you cling to the truth and cling to Christ, and, and Christ has done such an amazing work in our lives through that. There was really, a, truly a house cleaning that, that, that needed to happen, and so I, I, I want us to just get better at really being thoughtful about what we believe and understand how to appropriately interpret God's Word. And so that's where we're headed. Now look at this next point on your notes. This is actually from the Potter's Promise, a defense of traditional soteriology by, by Dr. Leighton Flowers, who was a Calvinist and split a church over it. Calvinists are good about splitting churches. I know that from firsthand, and I know that just from research and study here in America. But, um, but he's got a YouTube channel. It's called Soteriology. I highly recommend it. But he split a church, came out of Calvinism after 10 years, and now he's... Uh, he helps people to understand what Calvinism is about and what the Bible is actually teaching. He's got a lot of great videos. But this is a quote from his book. This is what he says, the fact that the Calvinistic interpretations of Paul's writings do not appear until the fifth century with Augustine, that's where John Calvin got his stuff, Augustine, should be of considerable concern. So what I'm saying is that Calvinism goes back to the fifth century. How about going somewhere in between from first century on to the fifth century where you got historical Christianity and traditionalism. 
So somehow the beliefs kind of went off the rails a bit in Calvinism in that fifth century. That's what he's saying. So let me say this again. The fact that the Calvinistic interpretations of Paul's writings do not appear until the fifth century with Augustine should be a considerable concern, especially given that Augustine did not speak Greek. So the New Testament is in the Koine Greek language. He couldn't interpret that. He, he didn't have the skills to really understand that and was also known to be a former Manichaean, Manichaean Gnostic. So within the last 16 years of his life, this is uh, from the research of a man by the name of Ken Wilson, who's an expert in Augustine literature, who's not a Calvinist, says a lot of that stuff came from that era. And, and he studied this whole idea of this Manichaean Gnostic, which was a group that promoted deterministic philosophy and was notorious for its fights with the early church fathers. So Calvinism is, is out away from traditional Christianity, from historical Christianity. That's the idea. Okay. So, so I personally believe, and this has always been part of our uh, bylaws and our statement of faith from the beginning, is in traditionalism, if you want to call it that, or historical Christianity. I believe that traditionalism is a more biblical, contextual, and rational understanding of soteriology and the sovereignty of God than that of Calvinism. So I would challenge you on that and encourage you to study. I've done the studies. I continue to study regularly. And in fact, I believe that traditionalism is more consistent with the nature and the character of God as revealed through God's Word. So here's what we believe as traditionalists. We teach that Christ loves every person so much that he died for them all. So Calvinists don't believe that, God, that Christ died for everyone. It's called limited atonement. That's troubling. That's the L in the tulip. John 3.16 refutes that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So teach that Christ loves every person so much that he died for them all and has predestined every individual who is in Christ, here's the key, who is in Christ through faith to be saved. And it is each individual's responsibility to humble themselves and trust Christ in faith. Now, the major proof text for Calvinists are Romans 9. That's why we're diving into this, doing a deep dive into this. Ephesians 1 also, and then uh, John chapter 6 are all proof text, text for Calvinist. So let me help you understand that, because what we have here in Romans chapter 9 is this collision of sovereignty, predestination, and election all in one. So I happen to believe in sovereignty, predestination, election, but not how Calvinists define it. So let me make a, just a clear distinction between the two. So Calvinists would say that in God's sovereignty, divine determinism is how they would define it, God has predetermined or predestined from the foundation of the world those who are elect and then those who are the reprobates. And no one gets a choice in the matter, and the reprobates will be held accountable for their sin and responsible for their sin, although never given the ability to respond to the gospel message or to respond to their sin. That's, that's Calvinism. John MacArthur, I heard him recently say, on a video, he said, it's a mystery. We don't know why God chooses one over the other. He has reasons that, he has reasons we don't know. I know, I know, this is what he says, I know it looks unjust, but God is always just, no matter what he may look. That's not rational. That doesn't make sense. That's ridiculous. No, that is not just. That he's just going to pick and choose almost kind of randomly, but they say, well, no, he's got, he's got his reasons. But I know from the, from the appearance it looks like he's unjust, but God is still unjust. It's a mystery. This is how they would define it. Here's how we, we would say is that, yeah, from, uh, God is sovereign, and from, 
And so in his sovereignty, he has predetermined or predestined from the foundation of the world those that are in Christ are saved and those that are outside of Christ are lost. That's how we would define it. It's important to make that, make that distinction. And I think this is the same basic uh, thought that Paul is talking about here in Romans 9 as, as we work through that. And so, let me go back to the text. So, when we study a text, it's always you got to understand there's a historical, there's a cultural, and there's a literary context. And this is where I think the Calvinists go wrong when they interpret chapter 9. I don't think they're, they're taking that into consideration. It's totally out of context. And they're coming in with their preconceived ideas, and it's more of a, uh, an iso Jesus. It's bringing their thoughts to the text rather than letting the text speak to us. In understanding that. So here, really, here's the text. So, so those who were ethnically Jewish found it unthinkable that God would reject his chosen people, Israel, and instead allow those deplorable Gentile dogs to go into the kingdom of God rather than his own people. That's the idea here. That's the cultural understanding. Why aren't more Jews committing their life to Christ? What's going on? And so Romans 9 is not the narrowing of the scope of election to just a few people God wants saved, that would be Calvinism, but it is the broadening the scope of election, making salvation available to as many as possible. That's traditionalism. I actually think that it's speaking of traditionalism more than it is of Calvinism, when you understand the context, the literary, historical, cultural context of what he's speaking about here. So here, here it is. So, so the chosen are, here's your first fill in the blank. I know some of you are going, woohoo, we got the first fill in the blank. Here we go, brokenhearted over the lost. The, the, the chosen are brokenhearted over the lost. Let me read verses 1 through 3. Of, uh, keep your Bibles handy here. Let me read through these verses. Listen to what Paul says. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow Listen to, listen to his words. See if we can get a little bit of a feel of these. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Oh my goodness, that's heavy. That he would say, hey, I see my fellow brothers and sisters, Jewish brothers and sisters, and I would be willing to go to hell for them so that they would know Christ. By the way, he uses this accursed and cut off from Christ. He would be willing to do that because that's their spiritual condition because they have rejected Christ. In other words, he's saying, I would, I would take their place. And I started thinking, would I be willing to do that for people who are lost? So here's a couple questions for you. Do you care this much about lost people? What are you in anguish about? Politics? Stock market? Crime rate? Phoenix Suns playing horribly in the playoffs. I was yelling at the screen this last week. I'm not in anguish over it, believe me. Calvinism would say that Paul, Paul wants people saved more than God wants people saved. Those Jews are outside of God's election according to Calvinism. Come on, Paul, get over it. Don't be so brokenhearted. God didn't elect them. Just deal with it. I've heard Calvinists say that to me. Just deal with it. God can do whatever he wants to do. But I don't think that's the heart of God. In fact, here's your next statement. It's on your notes. Isn't it safe to say that God cares that much, if not more, for lost people? Don't you think that Paul is reflecting the heart of God for lost people? I'm convinced of that. I've got a whole list of verses right here that would... Make that clear. In fact, in Luke 19, 41 through 42, Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem. He's weeping. He's saying, if I could be like a mother hen and draw you in like chicks under my wings, Jesus, they're not elected. 
Don't get all worked up over it. According to Calvinism, isn't it safe to say that God cares that much, if not more, for lost people? 2 Peter 3.9, it's a great verse, and I've heard Calvinists re, uh, reinterpret this verse, and they literally do, I call um, theological gymnastics to write, redefine it, and you'll, you'll hear why in a moment if you're familiar with it, 2 Peter 3.9. God is not slow in keeping His promises, but God is patient with you because He is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Oh, that's not actually what He says, though. That's not, that, he doesn't actually mean that, any and all. You know, that, He just, just, Peter, you've you got to really understand the interpretation of that. I've heard that kind of nonsense. It's insanity. God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Let me show you a picture of, uh, I'm the bald guy back there, and that's my son, Russ, baptizing my grandson, Ezra. We had a great baptism party here this uh, last Easter. We had all close to 40 people. He was one of the 40. I absolutely loved it, stirred my heart, and uh, I can't imagine my son, my grandson, my children, my grandchildren, anyone in this church that's under my care, I can't imagine them not being chosen or given the opportunity to be chosen. I'm in anguish over the fact that any of my kids would be accursed and cut off from Christ, and any of you would be accursed and cut off from Christ. I take this really, really seriously what he's saying here. That's what the Apostle Paul was saying. I think that that's, I think that's a sign of someone who's truly chosen. They are brokenhearted over the lost. About three years ago, we had a gal that attended Desert Breeze for about 20 years. She was in anguish over the lostness of her kids. She came in for counseling, and she got the same counseling from two people who were on staff at the time who had embraced Calvinism. And they said, there's nothing you can do about the lostness of your children if they are not chosen. I was so upset. I couldn't believe it. I can't believe you'd say that to someone. That gal is still traumatized. We just saw her recently. She's still working through the trauma as we continue to try to counsel her through that. I don't know how many, I already said this, I don't know how many people I've tried to work through that kind of trauma. That is nonsense. That is not biblical. In fact, I think it's very demonic. I think it's horrible theology. I'm telling you, I am on my face before God, crying out for his salvation upon every person that darkens the door of this church and every one of my kids and grandkids. And I'm going to do that until my dying breath and praying for them that they would come to know Jesus. And I think that's consistent with the Scripture, and I think it honors our God and our Savior. That's the heart of the Apostle Paul. That's in God's Holy Scripture to show us this is what it looks like. This is the heart of God for lost people. I think Paul was able to write that because he just spent eight chapters talking about how Christ was accursed and cut off from the Father for our sake. I think he was able to say, you know, kind of like, and I think, I think he, he was genuine in that. I'm thinking like, I don't know if I would be willing to do that, but I, I think that he was very genuine. He says, I would be willing to do that, but, but he doesn't have to do that, nor would I have to do that because Jesus did that for you and I. That's the language that he's using here. It's just, it's fascinating Fascinating language. Jesus was accursed and cut off from the Father for you and I so that you and I would be forever blessed in loving fellowship with the Father. So I love the, the quote 
from a pastor here. He said this, before we can see the cross as something that was done for us, leading us to faith and worship, we must first see the cross as something that was done by us, leading us to repentance. So it was first done by us. Yes, we're that sinful and separated from God. Yes, we needed to be reconciled to to God. The cross was done by us, but it was also done for us. Yes, we are that loved. No one loves us like God does. Okay, so we're brokenhearted over the loss, the chosen. The next one is blessed abundantly by God. Look at verses 4 through 5. They are Israelites, and to them belong the, and he gives us eight blessings to the Jews. And I think that there's a, a New Testament parallel to those of us under the new covenant that's even greater blessing. But he's laying out the blessings. He's like Apostle Paul is saying, oh my goodness, I'm brokenhearted over the lostness of my own people, and look at all the blessings that they have. And they're not entering into the fullness of that. And so he goes through these blessings. Let's go through them quickly here. Adoption. Forgiven and given the family name and inheritance. And that's what we have as believers in Christ. Romans 8, 15. We studied that a few weeks ago. We cry out, Abba, Father. He's given us the spirit of adoption. We don't have to be afraid. We have a daddy who loves us. Glory. God's presence in the temple and leading in the wilderness. That's how he led them in the Old Testament. How does he lead us today? Where's the Holy Spirit today? in us, individually and corporately when we gather. I gave you the verses right there, 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 6.19. The covenants, a binding relational promise of love no matter what. That's 1 Corinthians 11.23 and 26 is the new new covenant. That's what we just partook of communion. And when we took communion, basically that's what he's saying. This is a binding relational promise to love you no matter what. That's how much our Father loves us. The, the, the law, the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, Matthew 22, 34 through 40. We've got the great commandment. Jesus put the ten into the two. We've got worship, sacrificial system, how to approach God. We can approach God in spirit and truth based on John 4, 23 and 24. We've got the promises, a Bible packed full of promises, the myriad of ways God wants to bless his people. We just spent, finished up Romans 8, perhaps the greatest chapter in the Bible, packed full of promises for us. Patriarchs, they had the patriarchs, the great leaders, prophets, priests, and kings. Today we have leaders in our church. The church is to be led by Jesus Christ through a plurality of leaders known as elders and deacons. And then ultimately Christ through the through their heritage, through their lineage. Christ, the ultimate and final temple, high priest and sacrifice. The sacrificial system of the Old Testament pointed ahead to the ultimate sacrificial system, or not system, but ultimately to Christ Jesus. He's the ultimate and final temple, high priest and sacrifice, Hebrews 8, 1 through 5. So here's here's what I want you to know before we move on. When, When you think of the blessings of God, whatever you give up to follow Christ is nothing compared to what you gain in Him. You're going to give something up. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. You're going to give up something, but I'm telling you, whatever you give up is nothing. It's nothing compared to what you gain in Him. Nothing. Man, I'm telling you, when you follow Christ, you give your life to Him, He doesn't restrict you. Oh, my goodness. He frees you. There is a freedom in Him that's beyond anything you'll ever know. And so once you've tasted of his blessings, you want everyone you care about to also experience his blessings, especially when you know what hangs in the balance. You know what hangs in the balance? If you don't accept his blessings and what he offers through Jesus Christ, you guys know what hangs in the balance, heaven and hell for all eternity. That in itself should move your heart to want to reach out to those within your circle of influence to help them to see what we have in Jesus Christ. This is what Paul is getting at here. He's brokenhearted because he understands the blessings that we have in Christ, and he's wanting to pass that on to others. I was watching the, uh, the NFL draft here a couple weeks ago. Anybody here watch the NFL draft? Okay. Like just two, two, three. Okay. Okay. Four of us. Yeah. Okay. Praise God. <laughs> you guys aren't into that. It's kind of boring, actually. But here's what I found interesting is that, that if one of those young men, when those young men got the call and their family... They, it was almost as if they were so excited, it was almost like they had made it to heaven. Did you notice that? It was like, whoa! Even the mamas were just like, oh, my boy. Got signed on for a big old NFL football team. Here's what I want to say. 
I'm not taking anything away from what they were experiencing. I think that was great. I'm very happy for them. But that is nothing compared to the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. All the achievements, all the accomplishments, all the acquisition of things on this planet don't even come close to the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. Paul wrote about that, Philippians 3, 8. He said, it's all worthless compared to the priceless gain of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. And so when you live in the reality of these, oh my goodness, you're brokenhearted over the people that don't have what you're experiencing. You want everybody to enter into it. And that's really the heart of, of the apostle Paul. So the chosen are brokenhearted over the lost, blessed abundantly by God. And here's the next one, believers in the promise of God. Okay, now we gotta get dive into this. I got to pick up the pace here a little bit. I might be going just a tad longer than what I was the other services. So um, buckle your seatbelt, put on your helmet. Here we go. Here we go. So believers in the promise of God. This is based on verses 6 through 14 of our text. Now, why are the Jews, let's, let's go back. Why are the Jews accursed and cut off from God? Not, not because God sovereignly passed over them and chose the Gentiles in some sort of unconditional election, that's the you and the tulip, not because of that. That's what Calvinists would say, but, but because God sovereignly, so God sovereignly chooses how he wants to relate to us, so God sovereignly chose to save people, not by, as we're going to see, this is what Paul works out here in this text, so God sovereignly chose to save people, not by pedigree or performance, but by promise. Pedigree and performance would fit into the category of flesh, achievement, what we must do to be right with God. Promise would fit into the category of faith. We receive it, and it's been done for us. So here's the argument. It's the same argument he's been working on in all of his writings, and particularly in Romans, the first eight chapters. You can't earn your right standing with God. You can't, you can't achieve it. You receive it. It's in, the, it's in the weakness of faith. Well, you might not think faith is weak, but it, but it is weak because you're saying, I need you, Jesus. I can't do this on my own. So faith, in a sense, would be compared to that of in weakness. I reach out in faith to God as opposed to works and trying to achieve it. So he's, he's making that distinction. And that's how he's saying, this is how I want to relate to people, and this is how people are going to relate to me. By the way, write these down in your notes, Galatians 3.10 because he's saying to the churches in that region of Galatia, he's actually saying that because you're trying to, you've, you've fallen back into the works of the law, you've fallen prey to that because you, you, you were saved by grace through faith in Christ, but now you've fallen prey to the works of the law. Because of that, you are under a curse, Galatians 3.10. Same language that Paul's using here. They are cursed and they are cut off from Christ. In fact, Galatians 5.4, he actually says, because you think you are justified by your works, you are cut off from Christ. So he's using the same language. So when we think we can achieve right standing with God based on our own efforts, pedigree, performance, as he's going to show here, rather than promise, you are under curse and you are cut off from Christ. You can't do it. That's the point that he's making. Now, let's take a look at this. It's not by pedigree, so it's based on promise. Look at verses 6 through 9. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. Why are not more Jews uh, committed to Christ is what people are thinking. Well, it's not because God's word has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So he's going to make a distinction. He does a really good job at helping us to understand that. And not all are children of Abraham because they are the offspring. Just because you're the offspring of Abraham doesn't mean you're a child of Abraham. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Now he's going to explain this. This means that it is not the children of the flesh. It's not natural Israel. It's not works. Not works righteousness. Who are the children of God, but the children of promise... Spiritual Israel are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said about this time next year, I will return and Sarah will have a son. So he's taking us back to the story in the 12th chapter of Genesis. Here's the key. 
Here's the key verse, verse 8. Not children of flesh, works, but children of promise, faith. So go back to the story in Genesis. Remember when he called Abraham. Remember the promise that he made to Abraham? God shows up to Abraham and he calls him and he makes the promise of a fruitful and fulfilling relationship with God. Fruitful, yeah, lineage, family, and uh, fulfilling land, land of milk and honey, promised land. And, and so here's what's interesting. To understand this, you've got to go to Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 31, because the apostle Paul says, listen to me, I don't want to lose you, this is an allegory, figurative, of the flesh versus faith. So he's talking about the story of Abraham. Remember the story of Abraham where God promised them lineage and then he's thinking like, hey, you know what? My wife's 90 years old. She's barren. She's not going to have kids. And so Sarah has this crazy idea and says to Abraham, hey, you know what? That Hagar, that maidservant that I've got there, why don't you uh, hook up with her and we'll start it going here. Maybe help God out a little bit. We'll get this thing rolling with Hagar. And he goes, uh, Oh, no, no, we, we, oh, that's not a bad idea. I think we're, I think, yeah, th thank you for, oh, yeah. He's an idiot. I mean, he's a crazy idiot. So he goes to bed with Hagar thinking that somehow they're going to jumpstart this lineage thing for God. And God says, in fact, Paul says in Galatians 4, 21 through 31, this is an allegory. It's figurative speech of the flesh. Versus faith. Hagar represents works. You can't do that. It's based on promise. Faith is the promise. It's through Sarah. By the way, when do we know that uh, Abraham actually engaged his faith? And, we, and it's really based on faith. Well, it wasn't for a few chapters later, Genesis 15. Remember, uh, Abraham's kind of traumatized by this whole thing. It's like, she's 90 years old. I'm 100 years old. There's no way we're going to have kids. God shows up and says, hey, Abraham, listen, I'm, uh, I'm your shield and great reward. I'm your primary, uh, primary blessing. Everything else is secondary. Your lineage and land, that's secondary. I'm your primary blessing. This is where you're going to find your reward. You've got to get your identity from me. And, oh, by the way, Abraham, I know you're barren, so uh, I know you're troubled by all that, but come on outside. Let me show you. See the, scar the stars in the sky? Count those. Uh, you can't, can you? No. So shall your offspring be. I'm going to bring that promise to you. and I'm going to make it happen. And it says in Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness based on that promise. So, so here's, here's the idea. It's the same thing Paul's been working in all of his writings, particularly in Romans. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. It's not works. It's by faith. And he's going to continue to work, work that out. So let me kind of walk you through this. So the Calvinist perspective, God's choice with regard to who will be saved is made without reference to that person's faith or anything else they do. And those who are not chosen are passed over and remain in their condemned state with no hope of salvation. That's the Calvinist perspective. The theological term for this very unfortunate group is, I've already stated, the reprobates. And so if we want to understand what the Bible teaches about election, we need to understand what it says about the reprobate and about those who are passed over and the unchosen and the unelect. So to do that, we have to go back to the story of God's choice of Abraham's family. So I've already kind of built the foundation for your understanding of, of Romans 9. It's based on, he's making his selection. God's selection is based on faith and not the flesh or works. You guys track with that? So it's based, on, it's based on promise, not pedigree, and eventually we'll get to performance. He makes that very clear too. It's not based on that. It's based on the promise of God. But I'm about, to, I'm about to take you into something, a deeper truth here that I think most people miss and most Calvinists don't understand that it's quite profound of why he called Abraham and what he called Abraham to do. And so in Genesis chapter 12, remember the promise of a fruitful and fulfilling relationship with God. When Abraham's family was chosen, everyone else was passed over. We would all agree with that. We see that in the text. And so choosing one always means rejecting others. 
God chose Abraham's family and did not pick the Canaanites. So Abraham's family was the elect nation and the other nations were the reprobate. So now that may seem unfair because the question would be why Abraham's family and not the Canaanites? But this is not the end of the story, if you understand the story. Calvinism would make that the end of the story. Well, of course, they're the elect, the rest are reprobates, God passed over them, let's move on. What's it to you, old man? God can do whatever he wants to. And that's what I've had people say to me, Calvinists say to me. Here's what you need to understand. God chose Abraham's family for the sake of all the other nations. Did you catch this in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 through 3? Let me read it. This is profound. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who honors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Do you hear what he's saying? God's sovereign choice of Abraham was not an end in itself. It was the providential means to the end of bringing the blessing of God's salvation to those who were initially passed over. It's on your notes. God's electing love always carries the goal of bringing that same love to all the families of the world. Abraham's family was chosen by God in order to bless the reprobate nations. The elect are chosen for the sake of those who are not elect so that they can become the elect. Here's the next one, not by performance. Look at verses 10 through 14. Look at verse 10. Not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived. So they kind of go up to the next generation. So you got Jacob and Rebekah, his wife, had conceived, had conceived had, con uh, had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac. Uh, verse, verse 11, not because of works, but because of him who calls. That's the key phrase right here. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. Once again, it's based on promise. He calls, he invites us into the promise. Not because of anything they've done. Verse 12, she was told... She was told the older will serve the younger. Why is he choosing, why is he going against culture? Uh, the, the, it was primogenitor. The elder brother would always get the blessing. But God said, I'm not, I'm not, I don't go that way. I'm going to go with the weaker. In fact, out of the two of these, uh, Jacob was the weaker. Esau was the outdoorsman. He was the tough guy. Jacob was the mama's boy. He was the weak. So he's choosing, actually he's choosing the weak. Once again, it's showing us the difference between works and faith in that. But something's more important here. Now, between verses 12 and 13 is a 1,500-year span. So verse 12, he says, she was told the older will serve the younger. Look at verse 13. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. This is one of those troubling verses that a lot of people are trouble over, and it's a proof text. This verse was a local Calvinist church's, on a local Calvinist church's website as a proof text for God's election for salvation. This is not a talk, this verse is not talking about election for salvation. It's election for service. I'm going to prove that to you in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to show you one more of John Calvin's quote. This is their thinking based on this verse. By the way, when I went to their website, it's a church close by, I've got, I know people and friends that go to that church, but this is their proof text that God picks and chooses whoever he wants. And that's not what that verse, they're taking that verse out of context. Listen to what John Calvin says in the Institutes. Individuals are born who are doomed from the womb to certain death and are to glorify him, God, by their destruction. That's Calvinism. That's, and they, they'll build it on verses like this. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Deal with it. That's what, they'll, that, that's what they've said to me. In your face. God can do whatever he wants to. Well, that sounds like a monster God to me. That doesn't sound like a loving God to me. That's what we were up against about three years ago. That is horrible theology. And it's totally inconsistent with anything we've ever taught here at Desert Breeze. 
By the way, when you go to church, you need to look at their statement of faith, in particularly their soteriology. What do they believe about salvation? Sometimes it might take a little while to really understand because they, they, they're not out in the open about it because it's so offensive. You have to almost start asking questions. So do you mean by, they're very subtle in a lot of what they say. I don't know why they do that. I, th I think that in many ways they're gutless. And they don't want to be open about it because they know how offensive it is. But that's, I'm telling you the truth. I'm shooting straight with you. This is John Calvin. This is what he says. So the Bible context of, of verse 13. Let me, let's walk through this. We're almost finished. I'm running out of time. The choice election is idiomatic and not literal. When he makes this statement, that's idiomatic. It's not literal. Idiomatic is like when we use statements like it's raining cats and dogs. It's an extreme statement. Try to translate that into Japanese or Chinese. They're going to go, that's weird. That sounds really weird. And so, uh, so it's not. So when Jesus uses that statement in when he says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to hate your father and mother and your brother and sister. He doesn't mean that literally. Because elsewhere in Ephesians 6, 2, he says, honor your parents. In John 15, 12, he says, love your siblings. So he doesn't mean that literally. It's an idiomatic phrase. Not only that, it's for service and not salvation. So he selected the weaker brother because that's going to be the family line in which the, the Messiah is going to come through. Genesis 25, 23 is where he says, he's quoting verse 12, the older will serve the younger. Contrary to Jewish customs, the younger Jacob would receive the blessing and through his offspring would come the Messiah. And that's what it's for. It's for service as opposed to salvation. Salvation is part of that. But he's saying this is the family line that I want the Messiah to come through. Here's the next one. It's national and not individual. Nations were commonly referred to by their patriarchal head. Genesis 36, 43. So here's the important point. In verse 12, he's quoting Genesis 25. In verse 13, he's quoting Malachi 1. There's 1,500 years that separate those two. Here it takes you to the last one. It's conditional, not unconditional. In Malachi 1, 2 through 4, the Edomites attacked Israel. They're from Esau. This group of people attacked Israel. Hatred in the Bible is often referred to as God's wrath and judgment against any nation that curses his people or comes against his plan. Genesis 12, 2 through 3, he said, if they curse you, I'm going to curse them. They come against you, I'm coming against them. That's what he's saying. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has everything to do with purpose and plan and God's wrath being upon those that would go against his plan and his people that would ultimately bring the Messiah. So God's expressed hatred for Esau is actually 1,500 years after Esau had died, and it was in reference to his descendants, the Edomites, who were Israel's fierce enemies. And this is what happens when you stand against the chosen messengers of God. Here's the last final statement. We're almost done. Paul's doctrine of election means that both Jews and Gentiles all stand together on equal footing as members of Abraham's family by grace through faith in Jesus. I mean, my goodness, look at the thesis statement for Romans. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Both the Jew and the Gentile. Sounds pretty inclusive to me. For all who believe. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Beginning in faith, ending in faith, for the righteous will live by faith. Verses 22, 25 through 26, it's the rest of the text. Read the whole chapter. He's saying, those who were not my people, I will call my people. Why? Because they believed in the promise. Verses 30 through 32, what was in Israel's unbelief? Because of, they believed in works righteousness. Why did the Gentiles get in? Because of faith righteousness. The chosen, here's your next thought, the chosen elect in the Bible is not just simply about being the object of God's blessing, but also the instrument of God's blessing to all the families of the earth. Gave you a ton of verses there that talk about all, it's all inclusive. By the way, the reprobate nations, the Gentiles, will be incorporated into the elect, by, uh, into the elect and be used by God to re-elect those Jews who have been cut off due to their rejection of the Messiah. And you're going to find that in Romans chapters 10 and 11. I mean, that, isn't that how our God works? So he's going to bring in the reprobate nations. They become the elect only to stir the hearts of the Jews to bring them in that had rejected the Messiah from the beginning. Absolutely amazing. Romans 9 is not the narrowing of the scope of election to just a few people God once saved. It's not Calvinism. But it is the broadening the scope of election, making salvation available to as many 
as possible. It's traditionalism. So the chosen, and I've got three more, not tonight, today, but in a couple of weeks when we get back, we'll go, we got three more we're going to go through. But the chosen are those who believe in the promise of God, blessed abundantly by God and brokenhearted over the lost. So we'll take a break next week. Thank God. Some of you are saying Mother's Day, and then we'll come back. So get your Bibles out and study the rest of that. We're going to come back and, and deal with that. And so I'll be up front at the end of the service along with any available elders and leaders. And if you're new here, oh my goodness, what a weekend to come and hang out with us, huh? Yeah. Welcome to Desert Breeze, huh? Welcome to Desert Breeze. Good to have you here. I'd love to meet you. If you've got any questions, I'd love to answer those questions for you. If you want prayer, I'd love to pray with you. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. It tells us in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 6, it is good and pleasing in your sight, God, for us to pray for all people because you desire for all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. So we right now put our faith not in our pedigree or performance, in what we do or our works, but in the promise of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, and what He has done for each and every one of us. And as objects of Your infinite and eternal blessing, may we be contagious instruments of Your blessing to all the families of the earth, we pray. In Jesus' beautiful name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Oh,